Welcome to ALS Today. This is Michelle Flum reporting. Today, we turn our attention to mitochondria, the powerhouses of our cells, which generate the fuel our bodies need and help our muscles to move. But in people with ALS, these intracellular power plants malfunction, contributing to motor neuron destruction and paralysis. Researchers are working hard to understand why mitochondria fail in people with ALS and develop strategies to bolster them in hopes to help people keep moving. Joining us to talk about mitochondria and emerging medicines targeting them is biochemist Mike Murphy at the MRC in Cambridge, England. Thank you for joining us today, Mike. Hi, Michelle. It's a pleasure to talk to you. Mitochondria malfunction in people with many neurodegenerative diseases, including ALS, but few medicines are available. Why is it so hard to develop such medicines? The issue is twofold, really. Trying to understand how mitochondrial malfunction might actually be contributing to the disease. And in addition to that uncertainty about what was going wrong with mitochondria, the second challenge was really trying to understand, could we get a medicine into mitochondria inside the patient? Now, that was where we focused because it was clear that most drugs weren't going to mitochondria. So what I did when I was in the University of Otago in New Zealand, I collaborated with a chemist called Rob Smith, and we hoped to develop ways of targeting molecules to mitochondria. And what we did was we could use a particular aspect of the mitochondrion. That is that they have a very large negative charge. And this means that positively charged molecules will get sucked into the mitochondria and concentrate there. So to do this, we developed a method by which we could get a positive charge attached to the drug. We made a bunch of compounds like this, and we found that they were taken up by mitochondria very effectively, and they would concentrate many hundred times there. In people with ALS, many of these intracellular power plants are operating at reduced capacity. Do you think that this strategy could nevertheless be used to target these medicines to their intracellular power plants? That's a very good question because to some extent we're trying to target molecules to mitochondria to stop them going wrong, but we're using mitochondria to drag in the drugs. So you have a bit of a contradiction there. But what happens, we think, is that even in patients who have damaged mitochondria, what we can do, if we get in reasonably early, we can get enough of the compounds sucked into the mitochondria because they accumulate so much. From the animal studies and the human studies done so far, we think even though there will be some damage and maybe decreased uptake, that's still sufficient to at least block further damage. So what you're saying is, is that in a number of neurodegenerative diseases where we know these mitochondria may not be working right, you have nevertheless shown in preclinical models that you can see those drugs still getting into those tissues. Yes. What we don't know, of course, is to what extent this can just stop further damage or if it could, by removing the damage, cause the tissue to recover. So that's something we're obviously very keen to explore. In 2003, your team introduced the mitochondrial targeted antioxidant, MitoQ. Can you tell us about that? Of course. What was known for a long time was that antioxidants such as CoQ10 or vitamin E or vitamin C should be very good therapies. The reason they should be good therapies is that many diseases have an increase in oxidative damage, which is caused by excess free radicals. And these then damage the components of the cell, like the mitochondria or the proteins or the DNA. And that damage then contributes to the disease. However, when we tried very large doses of antioxidants like CoQ10 in clinical trials, they generally were not very effective, except in a few very limited cases. And this is very puzzling. Well, we thought one of the major reasons why things like CoQ10 were not so effective, because there's no normal pathway to get it taken up into mitochondria, and the CoQ10 molecules themselves are extremely oily, extremely sticky. So even if you take in very large amounts in your diet, most of it won't get taken up from your gut. Most of it will just pass straight through. So the idea was, could we get a way of modifying CoQ10 to make it taken up into mitochondria? So what we did was we took the active bit of 
coenzyme Q10, which is called a ubiquinone. And then we stripped off the huge oily tail. And then to that, we added a positive charge. And that was called MitoQ. And then we found that the MitoQ was actually very, very rapidly taken up and also able to be recycled by enzymes, by parts of the mitochondria doing their normal job. This is important because the ubiquinone part of CoQ10 fits into the normal enzymes inside mitochondria. And what it does, it gets activated and then blocks some damage in the mitochondria and then gets recycled by the enzymes in the mitochondria. So it keeps up the levels of, of prevention of oxidative damage inside mitochondria long time. And then we moved on to show that it was protective in a very wide range of mouse and rat models of human diseases. Including ALS. That's true. We've tried it in some of the mouse models of ALS in collaboration with Rafael Radi in Uruguay. We've also done a range of other neurodegenerative diseases, including Parkinson's models, Alzheimer's models, and also in models of multiple sclerosis. So all of these are very promising, but of course, when switching these to human trials will be still some challenges. A major challenge, of course, is always knowing what time to dose, because what we'd like to be able to do is to dose with MitoQ as early as possible to stop damage. So for example, we did a one-year trial against Parkinson's disease, but sadly we didn't see any prevention of damage or progression of the disease. We think that was because too much damage had occurred in the brain of the patients by the time they get diagnosed and turn up in their doctor's surgery. With ALS, we don't know where the same will occur, but we're hopeful that if we can get in early enough, we may at least slow down the progression or stabilize the disease. Are there plans in the works to test MitoQ in the ALS clinic? There are no concrete plans at this stage. We're hopeful, though, that clinicians are interested in driving forward these studies. We will be able to work with them to push this forward. So you're thinking, then, that as more and more people in the ALS community learn about these studies from the pastor in Uruguay about its potential, that they may take a look at it, repeat those results, and ultimately bring that same strategy to the clinic. We hope so. One of the advantages of MitoQ is that it's already been in patients, which greatly simplifies running a trial. But of course, it still requires someone to run the trial, and we have many other types of trial on the, on the go at the moment. MitoQ helps to bolster mitochondria by neutralizing damaging free radicals generated in people with ALS, but there are many reasons that these intracellular powerhouses can go offline. Mitochondria can go wrong in many different ways, but there seems to be a common theme that free radicals get produced, and this contributes to a wide range of diseases. We think what's going on in ALS may involve, may be perhaps inflammation or damage to mitochondria, and that might be common to many other neurodegenerative diseases. My gut feeling would be that mitochondrial damage is an important aspect of all of these diseases and maybe a common thread going through all of these types of disorders. So we'd hope that this technology would lead on to drugs like MitoQ and also many other types of drug downstream from this that might be of use in these diseases. But of course it's very early days and what we need as well are better ways to diagnose these patients early so we could intervene as quickly as possible as soon as we've got a hint that they might have be coming down with this disorder. So what you're saying is, I think, that we know mitochondria in some way fail in these diseases. By delivering these antioxidants, we may be able to help them, protect them, but at the end of the day, we don't know not only why people develop diseases such as ALS, we also don't really know what causes those mitochondria to fail. So it seems to me that as we study models of these diseases, as we understand what causes mitochondria to fail, we could use these same technologies to deliver medicines that can correct these defects. Yes, that's exactly right. What's all the evidence is pointing out that mitochondria are central to the development of many of these diseases. The indications so far are that things like MitoQ work because free radicals are involved in this development. But of course, we really want to know earlier on what's actually underlying that increase in free radical production 
and then we might be able to have even better, more targeted drugs going to the mitochondria to block those processes. And in the meantime, what I think you're saying is, what you're hoping is, that if we can find people with ALS as quickly as possible, perhaps by using medicines that we have now, like MitoQ, we can help keep that energy flowing and potentially help slow down the progression of their disease. Yes, that's our best hope at the moment, that we may be with things like MitoQ, we might be able to slow down the progression, but of course we need to do the proper clinical trials to establish that in patients. If that's the case, then that would be an improvement for those patients and for the families. But of course, this would I would see as a stepping stone to moving forward to the next stage of being able to understand better the processes that make the mitochondria go wrong and block that damage and perhaps ideally reverse the damage so that we can restore the nerves to what they were like before the start of the ALS damaging process. I want to thank you for joining us today, Mike, and telling us about your discoveries. Thank you, Michelle. It's been a pleasure, and I hope we can work together towards improving the outcome for the patients who develop the disease now and in the future. For ALS Today, this is Michelle Flum reporting from Cambridge, Massachusetts.